it's an honor to be here. This is an absolutely incredible event. I feel extremely fortunate to have been invited. Um, thank you, Pro Family. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you, up, um, the Up Summit organizers and Up Partners as well. So I want to talk about reliable robotics and the technology that we're building and really focus more on the roadmap for autonomy and how we see that we're actually going to get there. You know, we talk a lot about autonomous aircraft and how they can be um, transformative to the world. I want to get a little bit more detailed as to specifically how we do that. But first, every one of these talks has to start with a personal introduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my background in aviation. Um, I heard a lot of stories when I was a kid about flying because my uh, two grandfathers were both World War II pilots. My mom's dad was a flight instructor um, and was fortunate enough to get to fly uh, Stearman Taylor Craft uh, AT-6. He unfortunately um, had an accident that ended his military flying career, suffered a head injury, and then went into aircraft maintenance. My dad's dad was quite a bit luckier. He was a bit younger as well, and so he got deployed to fly the B-24, later the C-47, uh, and then in Korea went on to fly, I think it was the, uh, the C-54, and then um, after Korea was extremely lucky, he became an F-100 test pilot. So I heard a lot about it, this when I was a kid. I wanted to show these pictures too because we just uncovered this picture of my dad's dad, and we know he didn't fly this plane, but we don't know what aircraft this is other than we know it's not a plane he flew. If anybody in the audience is an airplane buff and can identify this aircraft for me, I'd really appreciate it. Growing up too, um, my mom one day pulls me aside and she tells me that her life's dreams since, since she was a little girl was to become a pilot. But unfortunately, the, the age that she grew up in, she was told that that's not a thing women do. And so she was discouraged from becoming a pilot. But one day when I'm in high school, she sits me down very serious and says, Robert, um, you know, I'm, we're, uh, I'm a single mom now. I'm not getting any younger. God told me it's my, I need to pursue aviation now. I'm going to go get my pilot's license. Okay, great. You know, I was a moody teenager. I didn't really think much of it. But I remember um, my mom studying for her license and, um, and how difficult that was, but she's very proud that she got her license in under 40 hours. Afterwards, she joined Civil Air Patrol, and I got to go fly with her, and I joined CAP as well, and we did search and rescue missions together, and a lot of, I have a lot of great memories uh, in high school flying with my mom. It's a pretty, pretty cool way to spend time with your mom. She also taught me to fly, and, and more importantly, gave me an appreciation for the art and the science of flying. My career took a little bit different direction. I got into software engineering, um, had a TI 994A when I was a kid, um, and I was extremely lucky to land a job at SpaceX um, and ended up leading the flight software team, doing the development of the Falcon 9 rocket, the Dragon spacecraft. I was not expecting to see C2 outside. When I walked out and I saw that, um, I just burst into tears. Um, I hadn't seen her in, in many, many years, and I'm, I'm really thankful that SpaceX was able to bring her here. Um, after SpaceX, I worked at Tesla um, on autopilot. I shipped the first version of autopilot on the Model S. And I'm glad to see Franz was here, because I was going to point out that one of my favorite features of autopilot is actually the double pull that engages autopilot. That was not an obvious thing. In retrospect, it seems so obvious. Like, that's how you turn on autopilot. But there were lots and lots of other ideas that we experimented with. And I'm very proud of the user interface for autopilot. So Tesla brought me to the Bay Area, and in the Bay Area, this became a constant reality for me. I grew up in Oregon, and uh, with a wife and, and three boys, uh, we, we always wanted to go home to go visit family. And the drive from San Francisco to Southern Oregon is hell. Google Maps would lead you to believe that this is a seven and a half hour journey. No, uh, when you've got three boys, three little boys, and a dog, this is a 10 or 11 hour trip on a good day, and that's if you leave at four in the morning to avoid San Francisco Bay Area traffic. When my mother-in-law was diagnosed with cancer, this became an even more constant problem for us. And I spent a lot of time strategizing, okay, how do we get there faster? Commercial air travel. Um, this was brought up earlier today. Um, it sucks for this use case because the nearest airport is actually two hours away, and it doesn't actually save you any time to fly commercial. But thinking back on my previous experience when I was a kid, my mind immediately went here. Okay, I can become a pilot. I can, I can fly my family 
from Palo Alto Airport. I don't need to go to San Francisco, and I can go directly to Illinois Valley Airport, which is a publicly owned airport five minutes from my family's house. An 11-hour journey can be reduced to two and a half or three hours, door to door. How transformative would that be? So I have the resources. I can become a pilot. So that's what I did. Here's me with two of my boys. We're tooling around the Bay Area, having a great time in a Cessna 172. The next step, OK, I got to step up to the next airplane. How about something like a Piper Malibu and, and learn how to fly that? So I'm getting checked out in another flying club that has a Malibu. Great flight, new, new CFI, uh, and we're doing the things uh, that you do after you, know, you get signed off to fly a new airplane. And I'm telling them about what I do. I say, well, I'm an engineer, and I've got this mission that I want to solve. I want to take my family up to southern Oregon to go visit my, my mother-in-law, who's dying of brain cancer. And he goes completely pale, and his jaw hits the floor. And he tells me, Robert, you're the case study. And I know that you're, um, I know I just signed you off, but I need you to promise me that you're not going to go fly this mission. <laughs> We're going to spend a lot more time together training up on how to do this safely. And, you know, I'd, I'd gone through enough flying training at that point to appreciate what he was saying. And I realized that he's right. Low time pilot flying the most precious cargo that I have with extremely high external pressure to get somewhere on time. Not only that, I'm in a small aircraft, which are inherently dangerous. I'll get to that in a bit. In instrument conditions, mountain flying. This is the worst case on worst case scenario. So that's not happening. Dream shattered. But it's not just me. You know, he showed me a book. They, they call it the Book of Shame. They, they literally have a book at West Valley Flying Club of other engineers about my age who got themselves into fatal accidents because they tried completing a mission like this under pressure. The statistics back this up, and there was a study published recently by some folks uh, at University of Tulsa, NASA, and the FAA that digs a little bit deeper into the data. And they found that small aircraft, general aviation aircraft, are eight to 15 times more dangerous than driving. Causes of fatal accidents are highly preventable. It's loss of control, getting disoriented when you fly into clouds. It's controlled flight into terrain, which means plane is flying, wings level, everything's great, and you smash into the side of a mountain. But there's a silver lining. The study also found, these studies also found that the causes of these accidents are extremely preventable with automation. We have the technology, and I mean like we, we as a nation, as a species, have the technology to put, techno uh, put things into aircraft that can prevent these accidents. Okay, long introduction, but that's what we're building at Reliable Robotics. And I want to get through this quickly. We've got, here is our unmanned Cessna 172. We flew this back in 2019. This is relatively easy to automate an aircraft end to end. The hard problem is certification, and that's what I want to focus on more. And I'll just skip through this. You can find this on our, on our website. So how do you automate an aircraft? First, you need a navigation system that understands where the aircraft is at extremely high integrity at all times. Instruments today in aircraft it expect the pilot to sit there and monitor and to cross-check. We needed to build technology that did all of that automatically, that gives you a single output to tell you precisely where the aircraft is so that you could do things like this. Auto land an aircraft without the pilot needing to sit there and monitor it. Um, pilots in the audience? Okay, good, all right. Instrument landing system, CAT3C ILS is the only system today that allows you to bring a plane all the way down to the ground decision height zero without touching the controls. ILS requires infrastructure at the airport. If you want small aircraft to be able to do this, we're not going to install CAT3C ILS at every airport. In fact, there was a bill recently in Congress that proposed doing that at, I believe, 10 airports in the United States at a cost to taxpayers of $860 million. And that's just for the equipment that goes at the airport. So we need to take this navigation technology and put it into an airplane and work with the FAA, work with the regulator on the processes for how we get this certified. And that's what we did. We have an issue paper with the FAA that authorizes us to take a Part 23 aircraft all the way down to the ground. For the pilots, this means if the runway has an LPV or a CAT-2, you can take our system all the way to the floor. Second, you got to be able to do automated takeoff. The takeoff itself is the easy part. Most aircraft want to fly. The hard part is takeoff rejection. 
And that means systems that can monitor everything in the aircraft, all of the things that a pilot is monitoring before V rotate, and automatically arrest, shut the power off, arrest the aircraft, bring it to a safe stop on the runway. That includes an anti-skid system. We're putting that into small aircraft as well. And once you've got that, once you've got auto takeoff, you've got the anti-skid, you've got the landing, you can do taxiing. And taxiing requires navigation databases, which for many, many airports in the United States and a lot of parts of Europe and the rest of the world already exist. We can use those navigation databases to automatically taxi. This is going to go a really long ways to save lives, okay? Controlled flight into terrain, loss of control, fuel mismanagement, aircraft misconfiguration, runway incursions, which we've been dealing with a lot recently with larger aircraft, as well as runway excursions are going to be solved with this technology. This is our training simulator in Mountain View, California. You all are welcome to come see it if you want to look at it. This is what it looks like in our phase one certification. We've got a flight management system that sits to the right of the primary flight display, and the new interface for pilots is to program the aircraft. We had somebody come in recently from a partner that we're working with, and they said, this is really different than operations today. This is not what we were expecting. They said, pilots of the future are going to be operating aircraft much more like astronauts, and I took that as a compliment. But we're not stopping there. What we're also working on in parallel is technology then that lets you take the pilot out of the plane and put them into a control center. So how do you do that? Well, first, you've all heard of detect and avoid. We're building an air-to-air -air radar. And I guess this is the first time that we've announced this publicly, so an up-summit announcement. We're building an air-to-air -air radar that complies with the standards the FAA has accepted. There's a lot of other ideas out there about how to solve detect and avoid using other types of technologies that are going to rely on pushing new standards through the FAA. The FAA has already published TSOs C211 and C212. It's hard to build equipment that meets those standards. That's what we're doing. We're just going to grind it out. You also need a communication link that allows the pilot to, the remote pilot to reliably communicate with the aircraft. We have ACARS, we have CPDLC, we have technologies today that allow uh, remote operators to send messages to aircraft. We are so close to being able to confirm those messages so that the aircraft can then operate on it automatically. That's what we're doing at Reliable. We're partnered with two major satellite providers and we're building a highly reliable terminal that goes out of the aircraft that is cryptographically secure that allows us to get a message all the way up to the plane, confirm it, and then have the aircraft automatically execute it. We're also building the ground station technology. And if you were watching very carefully in the image that I put up earlier, our ground station is actually the same equipment that we're putting in the plane on our first certification. Okay? In fact, I think of it more in the reverse. The first thing that we're certifying is putting a ground station into an aircraft. This is important because human factors for remote piloting are key. And this is one area where there's still a fair bit of subjectivity in the certification process. Our strategy is, look, it's the exact same thing a pilot would use if they were in the plane. It's a flight management system like they're already used to. We have a wonderful partnership with Avidyne. Dan Schwinn has been a great supporter. We've been able to put a lot of new tech um, into the Avidyne stack. Okay, so this is what the future of aviation is going to look like. It's not going to be pilots in cockpits. It's going to be pilots sitting in control centers. Initially, it'll be one pilot, one aircraft. Very far time in the future, we'll be able to get to many to many, where we'll have a uh, pilot managing multiple aircraft. That's going to require airspace changes and other technologies. That's further down the road for us. For now, it's going to do this. But think about, think about what this kind of technology is going to enable, all right? The missions that we'll be able to accomplish. Being able to own, to rent, or to pull out your phone and jump into a small airplane and go accomplish the types of missions that I wanted to accomplish in the past. Also think about the new types of aircraft that are going to be enabled by this technology. A lot of new aircraft designs that we're seeing. We all talk a lot about autonomy. Well, the roadmap to get there is through these small incremental safety improvements that eventually result in this. And this is really going to be transformative. I think if I can take just a little bit more time. I, I believe aviation is about to have its internet moment. We're on the cusp of a, a great, wonderful transformation. I think in the very near future, we're going to have orders of magnitude more aircraft in the skies enabled by autonomous aviation. And many more people are going to get to experience flight. And we talk about how the jet age 
shrunk the world and what an incredible next step that was for aviation, I think autonomy is going to be that next step that will shrink the world even further. Thank you.